Uh, also, Kevin Taylor, who is our Assistant Superintendent of, of Human Resources and Accountability, and of course, Bob Fank Bonner, who is our uh, head of our communications department. I'm Brad Breedlove, I'm the superintendent, and I just wanna first start off by saying thank you for being here and taking part uh, in this, um, oh, this, this community forum. Uh, as we talk about our three-tier bus system proposal, um, the format for tonight, will, this presentation will take about 35 minutes or so. Uh, I think that's what we timed it at, at last night um, over at Heidi Trask. Uh, we will use that time to not only lay out what the proposal is, but the proposal is really based on issues that we are having in our transportation system across Pender County Schools. The presentation that we uh, will give tonight is very similar to the presentation that we gave at the last board meeting. There are additional slides. As more information has come in, as questions have, have come to us, we've tried to build out the presentation to give you as much information as we can give um, to provide you with the resources that you need to see what, what is happening in our district as well as the two-tier system that we're on as opposed to a th proposal for the three-tiered bell system. Once we go through that presentation, we'll also uh, go through a question and an answer uh, stage. We have taken information from emails. We have taken information that was shared in the survey that we sent out, and I think we had over 800 respondents in that survey. We're taking that information, we've combined it into many different themes uh, that have, um, that really stood out. And being able to address those themes, um, certainly understanding that, you know, any decision that a school district makes of this size, uh, it does impact um, everyone. And depending on whether you have one child or depending if you have six children, you know, it's gonna impact every family uh, differently. But as a district, our goal is to make the best decision possible for all students across the district. That's, that's the, our lens that we use. And I hope that you know that we have some serious issues, especially in the air, area of transportation. Um, there, are, there are many things that we are very proud of. We are very proud of Pender County Schools. But we also know that we've got to get better in a lot of areas. One of those areas in which we'll address tonight is transportation. During the first five months uh, that I've been here, three of those months were dedicated to being inside the school where I spent the entire day in every single school that we had. It took about three months for me to get through uh, doing two or three a week. But during those listening and learning days. I talked to students, I talked to teachers, I talked to staff members, custodians, cafeteria workers, front office staff. I also held three community forums, one at Pender Lee, one at Heidi Trask, and one right here at, at Topsail High. I asked three questions out of all of these days that I spent. What do you love about Pender County Schools? What doesn't need to change? As a new superintendent, I always wanna know what I should not think about changing. What are those, those sort of sacred cows, all right? If you look at it that way, that this is who we are, please don't, don't mess with that formula. The last thing I asked was, what does need to change? What do we need to improve? I collected all of that data and putting that data together, you came down to certain themes. The number one request for improvement, for change, was our transportation department and our transportation system, how it is currently structured. That ranked first. Ranked second, which is the first time ever that this was not ranked first, was higher teacher pay. So teachers rank the transportation system above higher teacher pay. Make that make sense, all right? 
so digging into this, well, tell me a little bit more about the transportation system. What is it that, as a new superintendent, how are we structured, what, what's going on? And so you ask these questions in faculty meetings, in the community forums, what's happening? There we go. And so you can see here, here were the concerns that were shared from all of these meetings. The first is students arriving late to school due to sub, and that's bus drivers, shortages. And so anytime that you have somebody call out, all right, more than likely you're gonna run a double run because you don't have any more, any other personnel to drive that bus. And so a bus picks up its first load drops those students off, then has to go back out and pick up the next load uh, of students. So we have constantly in this district, we have built in double routes because there are not enough drivers. And we have constantly students getting to school late. That means less time in classes. That means less instruction for those particular students, time and time again. So these are, that's what teachers are talking about. I would love to have my students here on time every day. But based on that structure, that's number one, getting the students to and from school in a timely manner so that we are not cutting our instruction short. As a superintendent, that's gotta be number one. Students having to arrive early to school due to a double route, all right? What that means is that if you are in Surf City, if you are in other, we have built-in double routes. So we're picking up students, dropping them off as early as 6.40 in the morning to go back out to pick up that double run. All right, where, so where are those students sitting for, from 6.40 to 7.20 or 7.30? In a cafeteria, waiting for teachers to get there and uh, start the day and other students to arrive. So they're sitting there, who's watching them? Teachers, te you know, whoever, whatever personnel that we have that are getting there that early. It's structured, so we do have adults waiting on them. And the afternoon is the same way. So students go to the cafeteria and wait for that bus to come back on its double route. So they're sitting in there 30, 40, 50 minutes waiting to go home. This is standard operating procedure within our district students having to wait uh, once again after school. K-8 sharing buses. All right, when you combine grade levels, you have eighth graders and second graders and first graders on the same bus. Uh, we hear constantly that this, there are discipline issues uh, as a result of this. There are bullying issues uh, as a result of this as well. Instructional assistance recruitment for classrooms. In order to be an, an instructional assistant or a teacher assistant, it's required that you drive a bus in Pender County Schools. Right now we have 36 vacancies as teachers, teacher assistant vacancies across our system. Many of them have been vacant all year. We have people that want to be teacher assistants, but as soon as you tell them that you need to drive a bus, their one response is, take my name off the list, I'm not driving a bus so I'm not coming to work for Pender County Schools. If you do, if you allow one to, if you allow one person to take that job and not make that the requirement, then you gotta do it for everyone. And that, re, that means the others that are currently driving now would not have to drive. And then we would be even shorter on bus, on bus drivers. Instructional assistance um, out of the classroom due uh, to driving. When an instructional assistant is driving a bus, not only do they get to school late and to that classroom late, but they also have to leave the classroom early to get on the bus to do the afternoon route. So the window is, is very small and it, and it makes for obviously a, a long day for that individual uh, as well. And then additional non-instructional supervision before school um, due to doubles. All right, and so after school specifically, teachers are assigned to watch the students in the cafeteria or other areas until that bus can get back. Instead of being in their classrooms, lesson planning, 
and doing what they need to do to get prepared for the next day. And so we see burnout. We see these, these type of things when we have this 1,100 employees and 730 are either teachers or teacher's assistants. You can see how this ranks now number one in our system above teacher pay. So these are a few of the reasons um, that we have picked up on, uh, on the issue when it comes to transportation based on listening and learning and talking to our school personnel uh, out there. And I know that there are families that um, you just, you've kind of gotten used to your child getting home 30 or 40 minutes after all the other students get home because your child is on a double route. Or the way it works is that we pick up the furthest out in the morning on a double route and so those students get to school at 6.40 or 6.50 in the morning. And the way it works is they sit around and wait until school starts. And then at the end of the day, you take home your shortest route. So those students on the shortest route go home first so that we can get back and now have that bus out later. And the students on, um, that got there the earliest that morning now are the latest to get home. It's a super long day for many of those students. Um, like I said, so those are the current concerns within our transportation system. And lo and behold, when I came and, and, and talked to our teachers and staff, I found out talking to uh, Mr. Taylor, who's coming up next to speak, is that our transportation department has been working on trying to find a solution since October. They know that this was a, uh, an issue for us and are working to, to develop solutions. And so to here to, to present uh, our three-tier proposal is Mr. Mike Taylor. Uh, like I said, he is the chief of our operations, which is our transportation department and maintenance department. So, Mr. Taylor. Dr. Breedlow. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for coming out this evening to hear our proposal and all the work that's gone on uh, behind the scenes, so to speak, since October regarding the human resource as well as the fiscal resource demands that we face each and every year and the expectation that we continue to do the same or better services with fewer resources. I would like to share a few items regarding the concerns that were brought to Dr. Breedlove's attention. When he shared the concerns with us in the cabinet, I began to dig deeper into some of those concerns to see there are issues that we can work to accommodate or alleviate. For example, students arriving early to school due to scheduled doubles. Currently we have 12 scheduled doubles, which impacts 823 students each morning. And as Dr. Breedlove pointed out, some of the students, Surf City for example, are arriving on campus between 640 and 645 each morning, and the bell doesn't ring until 730. Students having to wait after school, 935 students are impacted by doubles. Obviously, some of those students are the same students, but we do have students in our uh, communities that ride one or the other. So the actual impact is much greater than eight or 900 students at any given time, a.m. or p.m. And then obviously K-8 sharing buses, uh, discipline, there is discipline data to show the, the concerns that have been shared by the administrators, teachers, as well as the bus drivers. Next, I have some of the guiding goals that we established when we began seeking input from our administrators who would then go back and share this information with our teachers, school improvement team, and et cetera. Primarily, we want to develop a comprehensive multi-tiered bell schedule that supports and promotes an atmosphere of academic excellence. That's why we're all here. We want our students to perform at the highest level possible. We want to protect the instructional time by ensuring safe and on-time transportation services, running doubles, does get kids there on time, but when there's an absence from a driver, we have 93 scheduled buses on the road at any given time. We have 15 people who can actually sub for us. That was earlier in the year. I don't know the exact number today. We have been recruiting. 
Uh, I think we've hired six or nine people since Christmas and, and we're continuing to recruit. But the reality is some of our subs can only sub sporadically. For example, a driver at Surf City, he works a full-time job at Lowe's Hardware. So every day he's not available to sub for us and run those doubles that aren't, aren't scheduled, but we need to do a double for a bus that does not have a driver that day. Some days he can, but most days he cannot because he has a full-time job at Lowe's Hardware. But there are examples all across the district that I could bring to your attention. Finally, or on this page, support the district pre-K-2 drop-off procedure. For those parents in the building who have students that are our youngest uh, attendees, just know that we want to protect the safety of those students. We do not want students second grade and below getting off at a bus stop in the afternoon that does not have a sibling or a responsible adult there to receive them. Obviously, we want to eliminate the doubles. It's, it's not beneficial for staff nor students in particular who are waiting up to 50 minutes before being able to report to class. We want to reassign the supervision of the bus drivers to the transportation department and allow our assistant principals to become better instructional leaders in their building by alleviating the demand for finding subs throughout the day. Only having 15 to 20 subs overall, it's very difficult to, to get those subs covered. So you have to wind up figuring out how to best get the students home, especially in the afternoon. And then we want to always look to improve our transportation efficiency to ensure that the best use of the current funding is available. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but our transportation program, and for the last decade or two, has been judged by the state regarding how quickly or how efficiently we can transport kids. And the idea is, you want to transport the most students using the fewest buses and then of course driving the fewest miles. And I know that plays a part in, you know, how are we doing this if we're making the bus travel by a house particularly for three, on three different occasions, for example. If there's a um, middle school student, an elementary school student, and then a high school student. Basically, I did the math, a generalized calculation that I cannot find at the moment, but our buses could run up to 50 miles, for example, during a morning or an afternoon run. With the calculation of $3.02 per mile, you get a figure. The reality is, each day that our K-8 students ride buses, we're losing up to the potential of 12 student transports, morning and afternoon. So that's 24 students each day that can't ride a bus because we have them paired with K-8. Here's why. C-2 Thomas buses, they're our newest buses and have the largest capacity. K-5 students, we can put 72 students on there. When you go to K-8, you reduce that to 60. When you go to high school, you can only put 48 students on there. So if you do the simple math, if we just run the, rear, the normal two-tier system, and as someone pointed out, we're already running three-tier for those students who are on the doubles, right? 1,700 students who are impacted either morning or afternoon. We're already running triple, three tiers. But the reality is, if we run three tiers, 72, 60, and then 48, that's more kids than 60 and 48, if you add it up, right? So that's the idea. We're using one bus, one set of tires, one starter, one battery, on and on. Additionally, for every bus we add to the fleet, our mechanics have to do a 30-day inspection. Our mechanics have to stop and fuel that bus. Even though it only gets 10 or 12 gallons, it still has, it takes time. Human resources, again, trying to make the best of the staff that we have available. On the next page, I think this thing keeps going to sleep. These are the three supporting documents that we used in conversation with the focus groups as we began to plan how to provide solutions or recommendations for uh, our district. The Topsil DOT study started back sometime in the 2018-19 school year. 
back in October, September, October, we finally got the completed final results. The number one recommendation, and of course, you know, DOT said, y'all don't have to do any of this, but we can't help you anymore if you don't do some of these. And we're not saying you have to do all of them, but we're gonna give them to you in a ranked order. The number one recommendation was to split the Topsail campus arrival time by 45 minutes. The number two is prevent parents from sitting in car rider line for 30 minutes prior to the bell. Those of you who are car riders know that there are people there who are much earlier than that, right? But the expectation is that we limit the parents who are coming on campus waiting 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half for their students to be dismissed or dropped off. We had a third party vendor take all of our current data and run projected calculations regarding our miles traveled, student pickups, uh, number of buses, number of drivers, et cetera, et cetera. Their number one recommendation for the topsail feeder pattern and the Heidi Trask feeder pattern, the only way you can get better transporting more kids, using fewer buses, traveling fewer miles, is to three tier those areas. Pender High feeder pattern is not included in this. For those of you who are aware of the Pender High attendance zone and have traveled out in those highway 11, 81, uh, 53, etc., there are very few homes out there in close proximity compared to Country Club Road, right? Peanut Road, Hoover Road. Uh, houses are much closer, uh, much denser population, and of course those students are in a much denser population. And the last one was we took our current data and compared it to our projected data. What will this look like? And there was a question yesterday that came up um, well, through email based on yesterday's presentation. The one thing we tried not to do, we had to have a start or a stop time. So we currently have a stop time of high schools at 335. With three high schools, we felt like we could backwards map and see where we could get to um, having the latest start time possible for the middle school. And again, going back to why are middle schools going first? We want the middle school students to be able to receive their pre-K-2 uh, siblings once they get home. So these are the impacts. The current, the current stop time for a Topsail Annandale student is 558, Topsail Middle School student is 550. That is the first stop being made currently under our plan. If we change, I'm sorry? Well, that's what's happening right now, ma'am. Our proposed start time, if we did move to a seven o'clock start for our middle schools, you, you increase the, the, the first stop time by nine minutes. Obviously, Topsail Annandale gets extended a little bit um, because they are coming 45 minutes later. If you go to the next slide for those parents for Surf City Elementary and Middle, you currently have a student getting up at 556 at Surf City Middle. The new start is, would be 540. If, for the Surf City Elementary, you see 601 and 628. If you would, please hold your questions to the end. We will get through it, and I will um, then open it up for some questions. Uh, but let's get through the presentation, all right, so that you hear the full presentation and then what we do have the ability to do and what we don't have the ability to do. Thank you. Thank you. So going back to the presentation, we have the uh, proposed bell times, which I know many of you have already seen um, and has been shared quite a bit. The impacts of our recommendations would be to reduce the traffic impacts and align with the DOT recommendation, recommendation of multi-tiering. The uh, elementary and middle schools for the topsail feeder pattern schools. The intent is to reduce the traffic impacts for Cape Fear Elementary and Middle and Pila. Eliminates the established double routes for the topsail high feeder pattern and the trask high feeder pattern. 
again, going back to those numbers, you know, quite a few kids are riding doubles in the morning and the afternoon. It does move the stop times for the first students up between seven and six minutes. It does allow us to reduce the number of TAs that are actually driving buses by providing a window to hire more drivers. We currently spend well over $200,000 a year in overtime alone for those bus, for those instructional assistants who are working beyond the school day. We have done a cost benefit analysis. We believe that we can hire up to eight full-time drivers and break even based on those expenses. I know there were some questions regarding how do you expect to cut costs when you're gonna give people biz, uh, benefits, that we did that uh, analysis and that's what we have projected. Additionally, our intent is to remove five buses that are currently on the road to park status. That gives us an opportunity to move those five full-time drivers who are already driving to become part of the everyday fleet with a reduced number of buses. Improve the overall efficiency, which I've already spoken of, and pr promote a more sustainable approach to the transportation model as a whole. Um, we know that we are routinely struggling to find more drivers. Additionally, we have a few buses that are currently in park status, and if we had those buses with drivers and put them on the road, they still wouldn't meet the demand of our current transportation needs. If we continue to grow at five plus percent, which will be about five, 550 students next year, knowing that 60 plus percentage of our students ride buses, that is about 300 more students being added to the bus routes next year. By eliminating doubles and three tiering, we immediately are able to absorb 144 of those elementary students or elementary age students or students in general. Additionally, by allowing those buses to run additional routes, we will, we will be able to absorb those um, other 156 students without adding buses to the fleet. The survey mentioned earlier by Dr. Breedlove has been online for seven, 10 days now. I can't remember exactly. But these are the respondents that we've had, 882. Uh, you see that the majority of them are parents. Uh, we have the three feeder patterns. Heidi Trask has 106 respondents. Pender High has 73. And Topsail High feeder pattern has 703. Obviously, the three biggest categories were traffic, childcare, and the early start time. The other category is large, but what most of the people said in those when they responded was that they were concerned about more than one of those or they had no concern. Um, some people have experienced a three-tiered system and understand its approach, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the most important things were those three items that we've highlighted, and I felt it was important that we spoke about those. Start time is still under review. We're continuing to gather feedback and look at options. I know that several people made those comments early on in, when I was uh, trying to present. Nothing is set in stone. That's the purpose of having the presentation, getting your feedback, the survey, and et cetera. The other item that was brought up was child care. Several people have made comments about being able to get their student to middle school and then having to go back home and get their elementary student and bring them back, sitting in the car line twice, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we had forethought there. We planned for you. There are 967 siblings in the, three, in the um, two attendance zones, Topsail High, feeder pattern and Heidi Trask feeder pattern. If you use a simple calculation of 60% being bus riders, which is actually greater than that, if, um, and I think we have that data that I, was sh that I shared earlier today, it's actually higher than 60, but I just use 60 as a baseline. 
that gets us to 387 car riders. Now, if you break that down by nine grade levels, because it's K through eight, you get to 258 K-5 students. We have worked with our PACES director to provide childcare without cost to our parents of siblings who are car riders each morning for up to one hour, well, it's 45, 45 minutes to an hour before school starts. Again, without cost to you, but there's 258 students that we anticipate that would be in that boat. Obviously, some parents live closer to the school and, and the car rider line, they can get in and out of it or whatnot, but uh, we, we had that forethought. We knew that would be important to you. Um, and then the final thing is traffic. Traffic is not going to be worse. Traffic is going to be better. The NCDOT professionals do those traffic study analysis every day. Um, and that was their recommendation to us. I'm not a traffic analysis uh, professional, but they are. And um, based on the, like I said, based on breaking down the number of those car riders who aren't siblings, we know that we're gonna be able to improve the traffic conditions. Some of the proposed solutions in the, in the um, information gathering form that we had, uh, move high school to the earliest time, move the elementary to the earliest time, move the middle schools to the high school time, redistrict the system, and then pay drivers more. Moving the high school to the earliest time. If we moved our high school students to the earliest time, obviously we would not just move Heidi Trask and Topsail High, we would also move Pender High. For the students at the high schools, the earliest stop time for Heidi Trask would be 4.36 a.m. For Pender High, 4.43 a.m. For Topsail High, 5.25 a.m. Furthermore, those students, many of those students already have, because their, their attendance zone is incredibly larger. How many elementary schools, how many middle schools got? So high school is this. Middle school is this, elementary is smaller. Uh, even in, in the western parts of, of the county, obviously um, Pender High has one of the largest landscapes. And again, um, because of the rural areas and the low population density, it takes a very long time to pick those students up. Moving elementary to the earliest time, obviously, like I mentioned before, we don't want our pre-K-2 students being dropped off at bus stops without a responsible sibling or a responsible adult there. Moving middle school and high school times together, that was tried, we, we got away from that. Again, going back to the bullying and discipline issues that, are occur that were occurring, that was, we thought we were gonna do much better pairing these uh, middle school and elementary together, but it, we really just shifted the problem. That, that's exactly what happened. We shifted the problem from one grade span to another. Instead of being a 6-8 or a 6-12 problem, now it's a K-8 problem. Redistricting the system, again, you know, that's been brought up multiple times as well. But the reality is we would have to go all the way to Highway 17 intersection up here on 210 to get just 52 students from Topsail High to move to Heidi Trask. There are a lot of elementary and middle school kids, elementary in particular, but high school, we have to come all the way to 17 to get 52 high school students. Being 300 plus capacity over, I don't know that that's the best solution either. Pay our drivers more. We already pay our drivers more than the state minimum, and some of them make more than the state maximum. We have to sub subsidize that state fund with our local funding because they've been driving so long, overtime, et cetera. So I don't know that that's a sustainable solution either. Uh, we don't always get more money that we can spend for raises and things of that nature. We get state allocations based on guaranteed raises, which we have to absorb, but then it's automatically distributed right back out. So if we're talking about doing things better, with the same or less resources, we have to think of other solutions moving forward.
And you know, like, like I said earlier, we're growing five plus percent every year. 5% of 10,000 is 500 students. We're going to be bigger. We're growing. We have the projections for 2033 um, that I've shared with the Board of Education today. We know we're going to be growing several hundred students each and every year. We have to come up with a plan. And it's not going to be perfect for everyone, but where can we build consensus? What are some options that you think we should be looking at and considering? Um, I hope tonight's presentation regarding the proposals that have been uh, submitted by our community stakeholders, you understand the thought process that has gone into that. We've been working for a very long time looking at all the options and want to make the smallest negative impact that we can, but we have to look for solutions to improve the services based on our current resources, human as well as financial. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Breedlove. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Um, I hope that the presentation at least brought your, to your attention some of the issues that we are facing as a district. Um, certainly, you know, as we look for solutions, and, and I know I've been here a minute, all right, when it comes to uh, leading the district, but this is our number one issue, and it's, it's transportation. And so the way uh, I want to go about things now is if you have a question that you think would apply to, to everyone, I want to give you that opportunity in this forum to ask that question and allow us to be able to respond or at least get back to you if we don't have a, uh, the, the data that you're asking for or don't have a response for that particular question. Um, if you have something that is personal to your family, that would be addressed to your family, uh, we will stay around after the forum and be able to speak to you one-on-one, -on -one, take your information uh, and be able to get back to you. There is a link uh, online. Um, I don't know if we can uh, have that put up. That will also allow you uh, to go in and ask additional questions. You may have additional questions over the next several days. We want to give you that opportunity to do that. So uh, at this time, um, let's open it up uh, to questions. Yes, ma'am. Certainly, I will, um, I will allow those that know that level of data a little bit better than me uh, to answer that. And how many, do we know how many, um, what I'm hearing is how many students are getting picked up at that early and making that route? Correct. 540, okay. The first stop, the bus. Would the first stop, the bus would be empty. But the intent is, by the time it gets to school, yes, ma'am, it is full. That's the way we have to work toward, again, capturing the most efficient calculation. They should be but that doesn't mean everybody who's assigned to the bus rides it every day. But we can't tell which parents. They don't call us to say, hey, my son's not riding today or my daughter's not riding, so we can't bank on that. It's kind of like we know that 300 plus students don't come to this campus every day at the same time. It's still over capacity, but they're off campus, they're sick and things like, same way with buses.
Yes, ma'am. Well, I can tell you that I counted seven plus thousand lines of data to identify schools sibling related because I didn't have a way to extrapolate that data. We have 7,000 family units in the school system. Now, a lot of the, like one of them has 30 something kids. Well, those are students reassigned from Onslow County, students reassigned from New Hanover County. But I counted 7,000 individual lines of data based on the family units that are represented in our school system. So yes, I'm certain that those siblings are assigned to those buses, but I can't tell you that those siblings ride the same bus every single day because they may be getting picked up early, especially if they're coming home, they look half full or half empty. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, and we do listen to feedback from our teachers. But I will tell you that the transportation director himself has driven multiple routes since Christmas, in particular because of the lack of subs. And during his time driving those routes, the routes printed off of TD-29, which is called a TD-29, was accurate based on the time he left, based on the time he picked the kids up, and based on the time he got back to the school. The only time it didn't work is when a driver did change the route without telling anyone, which number one is illegal, she shouldn't be doing that. Number two, the driver was picking up kids in an unsafe manner that we've deemed as an operational practice that's unsafe for kids by letting kids cross certain highways. We do not allow that. Yes, that student picked up in a normal manner would have to be on the bus longer, but it's safer because we have to make sure our kids are not crossing busy highways with potentially getting hit. We love our feedback from our drivers. We ask them to go out and drive their bus routes before ever picking up the first kid on the first day to help us make sure that those directions are appropriate. We also do what's called an upstu. Our data managers at our schools are responsible for going in there and taking off people if they're told the student's no longer gonna ride the bus. If we can get that student out of our database then we can run new routes for those buses and hopefully increase the capacity so that we are more efficient because we don't want a bus going to your we don't want three buses going to your neighborhood leaving 50 percent capacity we just lost a bus or two really right because we don't want our buses traveling What is your neighborhood? Can you please take that out? We'll look at that. Yes, ma'am. Is it me? Yes, ma'am. The comparison data? Yes. Okay. Yeah, those students, um, keep going, one more, right there. The comparison of the current data? 
Yeah, this was the topsoil feeder pattern, so not many. Can you pull the comparison spreadsheet up? Okay. She wants to see the Cape Fear Elementary and Middle School data. Yeah, so um, at Cape Fear uh, Middle Elementary right now, the current proposal or the current operational practice, those shared buses start picking up kids at 541. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, currently um, at Topsail High School, there are no advanced placement courses offered and your high academic offerings are not during fourth period because of the number of student athletes and those who are participating in extracurricular activities. They're already missing significant portions of instruction. Again, if you go back to the number one goal, obviously is safety, but number two has got to be maintaining the instructional and academic excellence that we expect. Um, yeah. You know, I, I read some of that uh, data as well, and they talk about ages 13 to 18 needing uh, more sleep, um, which, you know, for the most part is a high school age, and we do want to try and keep ages 14 to 18 our, our high school. And... And what I will say is, and I think Mr. Taylor alluded to this, is that, you know, this was a proposal, and this is still up, up for discussion, but when you start at 7, at 7 a.m., high school, whatever you do on the front end impacts the back end. So if we were to move it to 7.15 or 7.20 start as an earlier, given an extra 15 or 20 minutes for that earliest pickup, what that would mean is that high school then would get out at around 350 to 355 in the afternoon, which is doable, right? But students do have uh, jobs, they, you know, that certainly working with their employer, hey, look, I can't get there until 415 or 420. Uh, also, um, athletics, everything else gets pushed to, to later. We, we cannot condense the bus routes shorter than 45 minutes. We've looked at that. We've tried to do that without increasing the number of buses that are rolling. Now, we can reduce some of it to 30 minutes, but again, we have to add more buses, and our goal is to limit how many buses we're actually utilizing. Why? Because it costs money. That we're trying to... Okay. All right, so I don't know how many of you turned in to my budget proposal in which we did ask for $5 million more, but they gave us the minimum. And that was a gift because our Board of County Commissioners, all right? And, you know, when we talked about all of the needs that we have and we laid it, we laid it out, you know, here are, here are these issues in Pender County. And we know what these issues are, and it costs 
It does cost more money to run more buses, to, run, to have more drivers. Just because you have another bus doesn't mean we have the driver. All right, and if we pay drivers more, all right, where's that coming from? That comes out of the local fund, of which we, we were uh, you know, told that we will get the same as we got last year, even though retirement costs went up, even though insurance costs went up, and it, it was going to cost us to do the exact same as we did this year, next year, $1.5 million more because of those increases. Going to the, the county commissioners, and, and it was a gift. They said, okay, we will give you that additional 1.5, but we, we're not giving you the, the $5 million more, all right, that you've asked for. Those are questions that only they, they can answer. I can't answer that. All I know is I can, I can only spill out, these are our needs. Here's what we need as a district. And we are reliant on them. We do, the school system does not have taxing authority here. We have to rely on every local dollar to come from our local government. No, ma'am. We would like to our uh, we would like our board to vote on this in the June meeting, which is June thirteenth, because we have end of year closeout. Any changes that need to be made have to be put into our system now, so that we can run our scheduling for next year. It takes all summer to get that scheduling right before the start, and so school systems, school systems, if if we wait, this issue does not go away. And it only compounds for next year. All right. It's up to our, as far as more pay, when, to our local government. This comes out of local, this comes out of local funds. Yes, ma'am. When we do a efficiency, that is that is a state fund when we talk about efficiency, and, and buses are paid for out of that. So anything that we're lower than 100% efficiency, we don't get that money back. Uh, that money is lost. So we want to get as close to 100% as possible to get the full funding from the state on those buses. Hey, yes, sir. they can hear you got it um, teach your voice so what I don't understand is like all right I'm a driver and I'm trying to get as much as I can like you know like the more hours is the more pain so I can provide for my family because I do I do have as a bus driver and the great thing is that I love about the short period of the two months that I've been here I can take my daughter to middle school because I'm driving for the middle school I'm driving for the high school and I was driving for they switched my run and now I'm doing something totally different but either here or there. but the great thing is I can pick her up and take her to school because I'm going to that school and even if I wasn't it's okay in the morning I can take my two that go to south top sale and I can do that what I did understand was when I was doing it apparently I didn't know that there's a tracker on the buses that saw me move from my normal route because I was dropping these kids off and I got a couple phone calls well I didn't why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Well, because I was told I was okay. But again, I guess it wasn't portrayed to me. I'm going to say her. Like, I know, like, I don't know. Maybe it's not her. But anyway, she's not like, she, all she sees is the bus now going down Hoover Road to go to the school. Why? Now, what I, what I was getting at is when I leave the yard at 
That's correct. Dropping them off. Oh, we've got five middle schools. You're doing one, schools. yeah. Then going back out and picking up just elementary and then dropping them off and then going to high school and then doing that. That is correct. So what is the downfall to that? I don't, you don't want to, I mean, five o'clock in the morning, I can understand the five o'clock in the morning, that should be, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But one of my issues is coming, because um, right now I'm just located, it takes me 35 minutes to go from the light near the cemetery where Transfer Road is, just to get to the tower, and my daughter was like getting late. I mean, she's not late anymore because I'm taking them at five o'clock in the morning, I'm getting up, and I have all three kids, and there's no issue. But again, like, I don't understand, like, if, if you have drivers that are willing to do it, then do it. Like, you know, like, and it's gonna, because again, I've never, and I mean, like, when I sat through, when I, before I moved here, I talked to Monclin County, and the way the lady basically, the transportation lady basically said, you just come down here, you already have a license, you have the P&S endorsement, I don't have the air brake, because again, that took me two weeks to get, and I mean, like, you know, like, I will say that the DOT, the way they train you guys down here, is great, it's nice, it's convenient, because you're getting it right from the horse's mouth, it's not like, you know, hey, well, this, well, you know, maybe we'll do this. Now, as far as what that gentleman said, now, the run that I'm doing now, I pick up a kid, I go down Transfer Road, I go all the way down to Transfer Road, where I basically, it tees off, so you can go left or right. I go right, and I'm going towards the village, is that, is that close to the village? There's like a Carolina village or something like that? All right, there's a kid, I have to pick up one kid. When I have to literally go in the center lane, which is a turning lane, I guess that's what you North Carolinians call it. I'm picking a kid up, and they have to come. Now today, I was like, look, this doesn't feel right, and again, like, the way, I know not every bus driver thinks it this way, but basically, the way I look at it is, if, whether I'm picking up my kids, or I'm picking up someone else's kids, they're my kids, Bob. They're on my bus, either, either before they get on my bus, or the time they get off my bus, they're my kids. So, in that aspect, I'm, why am I, like, why am I gonna make a parent run across whatever road that is? I don't even, I can't even tell you what that road is. You know what road I'm talking about? Country Club, uh, exactly. Country Club. Country, it's Country yeah. Club, thank you, thank you. That he literally has to come through one lane of traffic just to do that. And what I did was like, I was like, all right, well look, you know, again, it's not that hard to turn. I just pulled on the street, hit my light, picked him up, backed up, and went back out and did my thing. But the kids were like, what are you doing? Well, it's, it's, you know, what I would say is, you know, I think Mr. Smith oh, is taking, he yeah, he's taking okay. notes. Okay. And that communication loop of with our drivers and, and once they're running routes, what is a better route? How can we better serve? What students are not riding the bus? Can we get them off the list so you don't have to go through that? That. I can't answer. Yeah, I can't. We can certainly, uh, we can certainly look into that, and I'll have Mr. Smith uh, talk to you on that. Sure. Right, and that that would have to be work with our sheriff's department uh, with our transportation. Um, so we're going to work on that, and I will ask Mr. Smith to get up with you to talk about some of these issues that, that are happening specifically on your route, as well as other drivers. And hopefully we can get that be to better serve our, our community and make things a little bit more efficient and better. So thank you. Well, the idea is that we are able to remove teacher assistance from, uh, from driving, all right, if, if they choose to do so. The idea is yes. And to hire, hire additional full-time drivers, all right, that would be offset because when you pay a TA to drive a bus, they're getting overtime, all right? And, and that, all, that money alone will help offset. I think we can hire up to, what, eight? Eight full-time drivers because of the overtime pay that we're currently paying is worth about eight full-time drivers. And that's what we want to be able to do is not make, not make an instructional assistant, 
have to drive a bus and hire full-time drivers. It's much more lucrative for that individual. I don't think so. Yeah. Majority do not. Some some do. Yes, sir. And he'll talk to you uh, after this. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hang on. Question is, when we're mapping routes, are they done by hand or software? Software. It's a per pupil expenditure um, is really what, what that boils down to. Right now we have about 2,200 per student as our per pupil expenditure for local funds. I'm not able to answer that. Uh, you know, I, I'm not able to, to answer that. Um, I, you know, I don't know what what the uh, total revenue for the county. Well, I, I do, and I believe that I was told it, it the total revenue for next year projection or this year that came came in was three million dollars more. Yes, sir. Correct. We laid out all of the reasons for additional funding. That's correct. Reoccurring. look for sustainability in anything that, that we do. How do we keep it going? What's the plan for the following year? That money, are you talking buying more buses, buying more um, bus drivers? Uh, right. Co correct. The issue is we don't have the bus drivers. Is there a cap on what we can pay bus drivers, and are we doing that? We, we We're pay close. some of our dollars. Some yeah. of our drivers. It is. There's a state minimum. Well, well he, he's explaining. Okay, here you go. Fifteen dollars. 
Yes, ma'am. The state only authorizes us to pay bus drivers up to $19 an hour. Anytime we go over that, it has to be subsidized with our local funding. No, it's per hour of driving, per, per hour of service. Okay, the state sets the maximum minimum that they will reimburse up to. So if you have, the maximum is $19. So if you pay a driver $22, anything over 19 is going to have to be paid out of local funds. Okay, it works the same as we cannot use our state allotment for bonuses or incentive pay. All that has to come out of local funds. So you can pay a driver $22, $23, $24 an hour, but anything over what the state says is the maximum amount that they will reimburse has to come out of local. Well, the state does, well, the state covers the overtime calls. Well, well, Ms. Dowling can answer this question, but see, when a TA drives, it actually costs the district more because the percentage of overtime is based on their job. And the percent, so a TA works 80% in the classroom and 20% on the bus. The district is paying for 80% of the overtime, and I'm paying for 20% of the, of the overtime. Does that make sense? As I as I stated, it would take it would cost local money, and yeah, yes, sir. Well, yeah. Uh, uh. And, and like our, and an example is, I will say this, our neighbors next door in Onslow County, who just announced yesterday they're going to a three-tiered model, pays an incentive bonus. Yeah. To what now? They pay the state, they pay the state rate, but they also give an incentive bonus, but that comes out of local, a sign-on bonus, and just like no Hanover gives a recruited bonus. But please understand that any time we do that, it's a local expenditure. We have to have local support to do that. Yeah. Actually, need five drivers less than we currently do under a three tier. Correct, and certainly we will have to. We will have to run double routes. believe and correct me if I'm wrong Mr. Taylor but what you do is because you always pick up the longest route first because the bus can get there on time early and then 
be able to, to go back out and pick up the shortest route, trying to reduce, because once you get into that 17 traffic, once, once you're out as far away as you can, it just compounds as the morning goes on or the afternoon. I understand that. I'm just telling you how it's currently. Yeah. Yes, sir. we have many issues um, and you know for for tonight you know this, we're trying to trying to establish a transportation system to get our students to school on time and get them home on time but as far as the sir yeah. okay, yes sir I get I get it a hundred percent and um, you know we are working on these solutions um, certainly want to prepare for the future all right and it's got to start now um, you know when you know of a problem you want it to fix it immediately um, you know and I know our board knows that and I know that our team knows that and so that's why we're here we have a transportation problem that we have got to fix and it needs to be done now so that the end of the year closeout can be done and we can have these schedules ready by August 25th when we're picking up students. Yes, yes ma'am, sorry. <clears throat> There's a, there's a couple of reasons, and um, that that's one of them. I 
another yeah and another reason that I heard in, like I said correct me if I'm wrong is you know Mr. Taylor talked about the shortest routes for elementary then middle school is a little bit longer and then high school it is longer and an additional item for middle school going first was that's a little bit longer than the elementary and so if a bus is off schedule by the time it finishes with middle school the shorter route elementary they can make up time to get back on track before they then go out to pick up the high school it's just at, it's just added these you know so there are multiple yeah there are multiple reasons why middle school was chosen um, but I know of th those two I don't know if you all have, have other reasons that you want to uh, talk about but that's that's what I have heard as the two reasons though so. So, yeah, you know, let me ask you, you know, I'm just, I'm just curious, going 15 or 20 minutes late, is that, would that make you at least more apt for a three-tiered system just to, to shift it, to shift it to 7.15 or 7.20 start? So it's the start time. All right. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying, all right, now understand, all right, understand if we do a 720, let's say, and give kids 20 more minutes of sleep every day for 180 school days. Also, hold on, I know, but we got to remember, also, the high school does get out close to 4 o'clock. And so, you know, I hear that you're for elementary, but trust me, that is going to cause an issue for high school students, all right, on that side. or sports or whatever it is. Sure, and I think the board will look at that when they make a decision on what to do, it, but it does impact. I just want you to have the facts on what happens. Well, you know, we have to, yeah, go ahead, Ms. Burns. And I believe that there are, I believe that they have 350 high school, um, Topsail High School students that take Cape Fear Community College courses. Possibly, you know, they, right. Do you have somebody, Mr. Taylor? Yes, sorry. We know that men mental health issues are abundant, and uh, whether you're elementary, middle, and high, we we see students all the time, and it's only increasing. So yes, um, we know that that is an issue, and an issue that we have to address as well. But um, your point is taken, and certainly um, that I health and safety is number one. Yes, ma'am.
we put out a survey in only 822 out of 7,000 families chose to, to respond to that survey, which is asking those. Well, we're, we don't have our mind made up. I mean, no, ma'am. And, I, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that that is not true. That is not true, you know. Once again, we have to make decisions that are in the best interest of the entire county. And that's what we are trying to do is lay out a plan that serves the best interest of all students. All right, and I, I get it. Tough decisions have to be made. And, and unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you, you have to give up something and any change could impact a family or multiple families. But overall, we have to look at what is in the best interest of Pender County Schools as a whole. And that is, I don't want to stand here and deliver any bad news to you. I want you on my side, trust me. Onslow County, they didn't ask. They just did it. This, we're going to the three-tiered system, and that's it. We're here to listen, all right? So we've done this forum to, for you so that we could hear your concerns, be able to address those to the best of our ability. 7 a.m. High school. Yes. Not middle school. Yeah. My understanding is it's high, uh, high school, 7 a.m. Yes, ma'am. That was pulled in order to get the parent feedback. Yes, ma'am. And I'll, I'll own responsibility for that. It was my understanding that we had had at our local schools gotten parent feedback, but that was not the case. And I applaud our board for making that known and being able to do that. So yes, this is important. We do want your feedback. And, and it's, you know, we are, we don't exist without you. All right, and we, I know that. And I, I do want to make all decisions that make you happy, but that is not going to happen. We are going to have to make tough decisions based on the resources that we have you know, how we can use those resources to better serve all students. Yes, ma'am, of all kids. Yes, ma'am. I understand what you what you're saying, and like I said, the 7 a.m. start time is not set in stone. All right. To start later. To stay. Yes, that that for everyone that's impacted by a 7 a.m. start. Now, not every school across the or middle school was a 7 a.m. or was it like West Pender? It's a so the, the Pender High School um, feeder pattern. Yes, ma'am. Elementary and middle currently share bus drivers. But the but more but you know you have more travel. Yes, that is correct.
Mr. Macon, can you please go to the Topsail Annandale Topsail Middle School tab? Okay, if you look, if we created runs for each school, Topsail Annandale Elementary School would have six buses, Topsail Middle School would have ten buses, and they would all those same ten buses would serve the high school. Is that does that help answer the question you were asking? Yes, you have South Topsail. So you have to look at South Topsail. I think it's up higher. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so they currently have their own buses. So those buses would run their South, they would run the Topsail Middle School route and then they would go run the South Topsail routes. Well, some of them will not because of the close proximity and the population density over here, they can run a high school route for us. Now, obviously, some of the buses in the bigger attendance areas will not be able to run all three routes, but our goal is for them to run at least one route before they go run a two-hour long or an hour and a half long uh, high school route. Those are for our exceptional children mostly, but also some of our community college uh, students are transported to uh, the Pergal campus. It is. It's state funded program. Anything we operate outside of that, we do have to compensate. Well, if we can park buses, then we basically get better credit. Oh, we don't get any money. No, the only way to get money is to sell the credits back to the state. But then if we do that and we need a bus, then we can't go get a bus. So at least parking it, we're taking it out of operation, and we're saving that, those dollars tied to the tires and et cetera, gas, oil, maintenance, et cetera. Yes, ma'am. I only have four grown ones, so I remember those days. As
Currently, we operate 93 buses a day, which is, and those buses serve 93 runs plus double, 12 doubles, which would be a, um, 105 runs, you know, in the morning and 105 runs in the afternoon. And then we do have some midday runs. With a proposal, with those current numbers, that's not counting the increase in student population next year. We project that we could reduce by five buses, okay? I don't have but seven, six or seven buses available now that I could add to the fleet. So even if I had seven drivers, I'm going to still, would have to still operate five du doubles under our current model. So we would have to purchase those five buses out of our local funds, out of capital outlay, which is about $130,000 a bus. So you're looking at over a half a million dollar investment just to take what we've current got, currently have and add to eliminate the current doubles we're running now, okay? With the three-tiered model, yes, it will eliminate doubles. No, we currently, we currently run, yeah. Yeah, we, we have, as Mr. Taylor stated earlier, 60 to 65 percent of our student population is assigned to a school bus in this district. No, 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 no. No, sir. No. No, sir, I didn't say we were going to hire eight. I was saying we did a cost-benefit analysis because people questioned whether or not we were actually saving money by hiring full-time drivers. Our intent is to take five buses off the road and put five TAs back in the classrooms and continue to hire our BART drivers and move them to full-time. Like this gentleman had pointed out earlier, he's not, dri he's not a full-time driver. He'd like to be. We would like to make him one. But we, the hope is we wouldn't have to hire any new drivers, absolutely, because we would have 88 buses in operation versus 93. Even if we did have the five uh, the increase, 83 or 84% of the Surf City Middle School students are already assigned to a bus. I'm not sure that many, I'm not sure that number would increase by double, but if it goes up, we know that we, can, we will have to accommodate for that. But we will be having five additional buses that are no longer in operation that if needed, we could, could put back on the road. But to answer your question, we, it take, we do, how many bus drivers we have? We have a lot of people certified in the district, but they don't all drive a bus. Does that, like, like our coaches and our teachers who, who, who serve in academic, I mean, athletic roles, they have bus license because it's required by state law. So I would say, well, I've got two openings right now, so I've got 91 bus drivers driving every day, and I've got subs filling in, and, you know, sometimes we run a double. So to answer your question, there is 91 drivers every day that should be showing up in the morning to drive, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, let me, can I maybe kind of walk you through that a little bit? Okay, our TAs now that drive elementary and middle school students, 
most of them, even with a double, probably only drive a total of an hour, hour and a half, I mean, 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes in the afternoon. So let's say two hours a day. With the three-tiered model, I can take and make that maybe four hours a day, which is more, which attracts more people to come and drive. I mean, I, I would not get up at five o'clock in the morning, drive the tops of Annadale, drive an hour, go back home, be back at 2.30, drive an hour and go, you know, for $30. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, that's grossing $30. That's not your net pay. That's just what you're grossing if you drive, work that one. Th does that make sense? So with the three-tiered model, we can offer a more, you know, more time, more opportunity for. Correct. And, and, and forgive me when you say route, because I was a, I used, before I was a transportation director, I was a routing coordinator. So when, the, when you say route, I'm thinking of bus. And when you say runs, so there's going to be more runs per bus, per route. Does that make A route is a series of runs, or could be one run. So, so we're going to be able to provide, serve more runs with one, bu you know, with limited, you know, uh, hopefully a smaller amount of buses. Yes, yes, that's that is the goal. And based off of what the study shows us, you know, with the current numbers, we can possibly reduce that by five buses.
back to the consideration. Yes, ma'am. They do. Again, consistency across the district has been something that the prior boards of education have supported. Um, I, but I. We ask for their help. They're not going to give us anything. I don't think they're giving us any benefits other than a third party perspective so that we can make improvements to our transportation system. Are you when you say problem? Are you talking about doubles being run every day? Because yeah, Cape Fear, Cape Fear Elementary, Cape Fear Middle currently runs doubles. Also, they they have kids that are dropped off at six forty in the morning, and you know, and they leave it they leave at three. 10 in the afternoon also. Um, we do not run doubles at our, in our Pender high feeder pattern because those students are so far apart. You know, we, we can't run doubles. I mean, they would be at the school more than an hour earlier. They still have bus shortage. They still... And, and, and I will say to to help, uh, you know, some of the doubles were created at Cape Fear to free up drivers to come over here to help with the with the problem we have over here because it's harder to employ bus drivers on the east side because it's so compet. The, the, there's so many much more competitive jobs out there. Yes, yes, ma'am. The more kids that, well, if the more that you can, that ride, and the bus does, buses do not increase. That's your, that was your 100%. Yeah. Yes. Right? yes. No, no, that's not the. Well, the state wants you to get closest to 100%. Yes, ma'am. That, but but no, that's not our right now. Ninety percent of our transportation cost is funded by the state. Yes, ma'am. Yes. We have to do a count in September of the actual amount of kids that ride, and that is what they use for the efficiency model. And also keep in mind, general statute states that a child that lives within a mile of the school, well, let, let, this is the way it says, a bus has to pass within one mile of a child's residence on a state-maintained road. 
So the state, by the efficiency model, any kid that lives within a mile of that boundary, we get penalized for. Okay? So like students that ride the bus, for, a fine, for example, the neighborhood across the street from North Topsail, we send a bus over there and pick up like 30 kids. We, we get penalized for that because by state law, we don't have to provide them a bus ride. Does that, does that make, yeah, so, so, so we fight that state efficiency, efficiency model because at the, it's a shame to say the more accommodating you are, the less efficient you are. The more, you, well that would be, Yes. Okay, uh, from my understanding, there are several building projects that the county commissioners are pursuing right now. Um, I think one of those is a new jail. If you've read any, in, um, there's been several articles written about it in the Pender Post and the Star News. Um, we are currently, from my understanding, sending prisoners to uh, other counties and we're paying other counties rent for our prisoners. So the county commissioners has decided that they are going to build a new jail. So that's, that's part of them. That's, you know, you've got to keep up county infrastructure with the money that they're getting in. I don't get into all that. I'm just about schools, okay? So um, all I can tell you is that every one of you guys You've got kids in our schools, you're concerned about them. I totally get that. I've got a kid in this school. I've, I've got my own son who's about to graduate. Yeah, I'll plug that. Um, my own son is about to graduate next Friday. So I can tell you that you can go to the county commissioners and you can ask for an explanation from them. Um, but what I can tell you is that we're trying to do everything that we can to be fiscally responsible. With, for what we're getting and if they were not trying to find a new way to make it so we didn't have to run double routes to make it so we could have more TAs in a classroom then I would be not very happy with any of them the thing of it is is they are trying to find solutions and that's why we're out here tonight and that's why we're giving you an opportunity to come to us and to tell us what you think and to offer us solutions. We're not turning you away, okay? But at the same time, we've got problems that we need to solve. So all I would ask is that work with us. Give us a chance to try to solve some of these. And if you feel that you need to go to the county commissioners to say, hey, Pender County Schools needs more money. Well, I'm not going to tell you not, I'm, I'm not going to say don't do that, okay? But what I am going to say is if you do go, please be respectful because I don't, I've heard how this works in other states. We depend upon the county commissioners to approve our local area of 
contribution. So all I would say is that if you do go up there and you speak to them, be kind, be respectful. You know, you guys have been, like I said, tonight has been, I think, a really good back and forth, and I appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to hand this microphone off because obviously I despise public speaking. But what I am going to say is I just want to say thank you to all of you for showing up tonight because it proves you do love your children, and we know that because we've got kids too, and we love our kids. So... <laughs> no, I'm just, I know everybody's got hands up and I'm, I get it but y'all you know like I said I think we can probably take a few more questions and then we're going to have it's 8 o'clock and we're going to have to cut this off at some point so I'm going to give this back to Dr. Breedlove and let his better judgment go yeah, but, well, yes ma'am Anything on the docket right now? All right. No. Um, I, I'll end it. I just want to, I, I, I do want to just say, uh, just to, you know, when we talk about funding, when I went to the county commissioners, the $5 million that we asked for were going to things like additional counselors. Our counselors right now are one to 392 students. All right. And that's because. We pay for three additional out of ESSER funds, which are going away, all right? And if we didn't pay for those three, we would only have 25 total counselors uh, in our system. And the, and the ratio to student to counselor would be one to 423 students. And so when we ask for things, um, transportation was it because we have a plan to try and help transportation, not having to use local funds, but we don't have a plan to, to uh, to help our students out, we have eight designated, state designated low performing schools out of 19. That's almost 50% of our schools are designated by the state as low performing. We need tutors, all right? We need additional TAs, we need instructional coaches. We have got to lift our schools up and there isn't, a, if we are using every state dollar that we can, but we need local funds to be able to do that. So when I addressed the board, I had nine things there that we need, desperately need as a system to make Pender County schools better because we are not serving all of our students to the best of our ability. So when we talk to the county commissioners, those are the things. And they came back and said, you will get the 1.5 increase so you can keep what, who you have now. But unless we use ESSER dollars in that and pull from this pot to do this, we have to make decisions. There's just not enough money. And so you have to rob pay, Peter to pay Paul. All right, and that's what we're trying to do to put out a lot of fires right now because our, our students deserve it. And you know, I could, I could spend all night and talk about the issues that I've learned in five months your voice matters. You are extremely important. I am not here, neither, or the board, anybody else. To, we want to make you happy. We want to make you proud of, and I know you already are, but the facts are the facts. We are growing, that is not stopping, and we are way behind infrastructure. On how long does it take to, you know, to, to get to the Burgall office from here in the morning? There's only one route. All right, you go down on 17, you get on 210, you go all the way around the game lands, all right, till you hit 117, and that's the only route. So when Mr. Taylor talked about, you know, redistricting in that for 50 students to come all the way to 17 to spend two hours on a bus to get to Heidi Trask, because that's how long, 45 minutes and all of those stops along the way. If you've ever driven that route in the morning and you've gotten behind one of our buses, it's a mile long of cars behind it, all right? We just have, we have issues, you know, and that one's not going away, all right? The roads are the roads at this point, um, but your voice matters, you matter. We want to please you and we wanna do the very best by you for your children. 
and it is going to take sacrifice by everybody for the common good uh, of our district. Pender County Schools has a lot to be proud of, and you and your children are the primary reason, and I mean that. Looking for school district, I chose this district. I want to be a part of this district because there is so much potential here, and the growth and the, just the word of mouth about Pender County Schools, and we don't want to mess that up, but it is going to take a lot of tough decisions, and you might disagree with me, and I might disagree with you, but I respect you as a parent. I will always listen to you as a parent, and the expectations for my staff is that we always listen to you as a parent as well because nobody knows your child better than you, and that's who we serve. So um, what I will ask my team to do is to, to stick around if you have some other items that you do want to share, but I'll end the, I'll end the community forum part of this um, and certainly uh, want to meet you and, and talk to you. Um, I'll, I'll stay as around, around as long as I need to just to make sure that your voice is heard or you, you have anything to share. And additionally, email me, email Mr. Taylor, any of my, my team here, um, and we'll certainly uh, work to email you back or call you so that you have any concerns that you have addressed. It's been my pleasure. Um, it's my pleasure being here in Pender County Schools as well, and this is a great place, and it will only be greater, um, and that means this continual dialogue. Thank you all very much. Um, thanks for